Great, listen, thanks very much, uh, Heidi, and thanks to everybody for uh, attending today. I know that we were expecting um, definitely a few hundred people to participate in this, which is amazing because for those of you who have attended our face-to-face -face meetings in the past, uh, you'll know that we wouldn't, we wouldn't have had those numbers. So certainly while um, we're not all operating in ideal circumstances, I think it was absolutely essential this year that we that we continued with what is now our fourth annual charity trustee week and um, because uh, looking at the level of engagement it's clear that there's a real appetite uh, for people to avail of what this week provides you know which is it's all about acknowledging the amazing work that charity trustees do um, around Ireland and I think in a year like this there is it's not uh, in any way inappropriate uh, that we would look and uh, you know congratulate and celebrate really the, the work that's going on because it is not easy um, and we know that from our direct uh, interactions with you in terms of our survey but also on a day-to-day -day basis you know um, we're, we're very conscious of the the difficulties that charities are, are facing to put it mildly you know, as charity trustees, you've all stayed in a role. And at a time when your charities really need leadership, I, you know, we are aware and I'm aware that you're making the kinds of decisions that you probably never thought you, you would have to make and that they bring with them, you know, huge challenges. So, you know, whether you're sitting there thinking, what are we going to do to fund ourselves, to keep ourselves going? And um, you're looking at a situation whereby in a lot of cases, there might be physical challenges uh, to providing the particular uh, services that you provide to beneficiaries, particularly where they are reliant on being face to face with somebody. Um, you, you're also facing, no doubt, a situation whereby with reduced funds, potentially with reduced volunteers, if people aren't able to, uh, to get to you, to assist you, uh, you're looking at how you can meet the greater demands that you're facing for your services. Because that's another thing I think when you, when you look at Ireland and you look at the diversity among registered charities, you see all of the, the gaps that the charity sector is stepping into in terms of what's provided by the private sector and the public sector. So therefore, everything that charities are doing um, are, are vital to the local communities and, and nationally and internationally to the work that, that you all do. So this is why it was so important for us, you know, when we worked with our, our partners for this week, um, that we would make sure that we had events that were of use to you as charity trustees. And that's been a real, a real focus for us to make sure that they're, they're practical um, and that everybody can get something from them in terms of assisting you to carry out your, your duties as charity trustees, but also to you know, give you a sense of what's going on out there with, with your peers as well. Um, so that is why you know, we're delighted that we, we had uh, trustees who were willing to engage with us for the purposes uh, of this important week and to talk to you directly as part of uh, their experience with things, for example, like the governance code. Because certainly as the charities regulator, we can say how we, how we think things should be. And we look to engage with you to find out um, and be informed when we do that. Um, but it doesn't really substitute for you hearing from a fellow charity trustee how they are getting on um, with important issues during this challenging time. So that's why I suppose why it's so important. Um, as I said, that we that we have this that we have this week. In terms of you know responding to the current crisis, one of the things um, that we were very conscious about from the very get go was to ensure that you could still contact us as charity trustees. So I really hope that that has been useful to you, and um, you know that our staff are available to assist wherever possible. Um, and, and as I said, that was a key focus for us. Also, another thing that we we really wanted to make sure that we did as well was to alleviate any concerns that people had as a result of the pandemic. So you'll be aware that we've extended the annual reporting um, deadline on a number of occasions, most recently to the 16th of December. Um, however, what we have found really encouraging is the extent to which charities have already submitted their annual reports um, so that there'll be, um, you know, a limited few maybe at this point who haven't been able to do so. 
So I'd encourage you to get those in whenever you can. But you do have until the 16th of, of December. Um, and again, that was about just acknowledging that there were some charities for whom it was proving difficult for, for numerous reason, reasons in terms of finalising their finances um, for last year and providing an account of their activities to the charities regulator. Similarly, you know, we were, we were getting a lot of feedback with regard to the code and people being concerned about you know, how do we get through the compliance record form? How do we demonstrate things? You know, how will we need to report on this next year? And there, there was a lot of anxiety, uh, certainly, it seemed around that. So we recently issued an information notice, which I'm sure um, a lot of you, and I hope all of you have seen at this point. And it was really just to assure you of the approach that we will be taking um, to compliance with the governance code and reporting on it next year. And for most of you, your, your, end, of, uh, your end of year will be uh, probably in December. So you won't be required to, report until October 2021, which means that you have, you know, just under a year um, if you haven't got to grips with the code yet and um, to keep at it. And um, hopefully you'll be in a position to report positively then when it comes to October next year. Um, so as Heidi mentioned, we have a number of events this week. We have two and um, our partners have another 18. Uh, so there's a lot of information out there for you. And as I said, it's, it's targeted in nature. You know, we're, we're dealing with issues like, you know, governance within a small, uh, within small charities. However, the one thing I would say that, you know, is we often find uh, that smaller charities will say that some of the content of, of different events, you know, doesn't directly relate to them or, or they see it maybe they have slightly different issues. And what I would say to you is that as charities regulator, we absolutely acknowledge that there are smaller charities that we need to engage with in order to understand the particular issues that they are facing. So if you would, if you, sorry, if you are one of those charities, you know, in order to gain insight, we do need your input. So I would encourage you through the chat function today or separately by way of contacting the charities regulator directly to let us know what the biggest issues for you. Are. If we can identify common issues of concern, it enables us to issue more targeted guidance with smaller charities in mind. And we can do this through frequently asked questions or specific guidance materials and templates. So, you know, if you let us know, we will absolutely respond to that where we can see common trends uh, occurring and it's in everybody's interest uh, that we do that. Um, as I said, a key part of the work that we do is providing support through, through guidance. Um, we've put up a lot of materials over the last few months, so I would say, you know, make sure that you're up to speed on, on what we have up there. There's bound to be something there if you've got a query that at least get you started, and then you can always follow up with us then subsequently if you're still not clear on any particular issues. And um, you'll also be aware that we carried out a survey, a survey earlier this year. We will be carrying out a further one. And what I would say, I would ask all of you here today, if you could engage with that survey, um, you know, the greater response that we can get, the more accurate picture we have to work with as a regulator. But it also enables us and those interested in the results of those surveys to tell the story of what's happening or what has happened in the sector. You know, what you're dealing with as charity trustees, leading charities that in all cases, as I said, are stepping into that gap between what the public and private sector provide. So um, in terms of uh, the governance code then, um, just one other thing I suppose to raise on that is the training that we're providing. Um, and I'm sure a number of you have already availed of that training. We've got really good feedback. We're always interested in getting more feedback. Um, but the purpose of that training was to provide additional assistance to charity trustees. We've been delighted with the level of engagement with that. However, what I would say, one of the difficulties that we have encountered is that even though places are limited, so it's not going to be possible for 73,000 charity trustees in Ireland to do this um, online training with our trainers. Um, so despite the limited nature of it, we are seeing a level of non-attendance. Um, so we would ask you, if you cannot attend a training session that you have booked, could you please just let us know? Because there are so many people who are waiting to do um, the training and who could really use that place. Because if you don't let us know, Unfortunately, the place is wasted and we, we won't have a way of making that up. Um, so I suppose, you know, now is really is really the time uh, for all of us to be to be looking at and assessing where we are at this year. 
And um, what I would say is that as part of that, we're, we're delighted to have Sheila Ann O'Leary here today um, to talk to you as a peer, to, to let you know about her experience. Um, uh, Sheila Ann is a board member and an official trustee of West Cork Women Against Violence Project and Aurelia Trust. She's also on a number of boards. Um, and today she's going to be talking uh, to you about her role um, in Feilachan, which is a, a stillbirth and neonatal death association of Ireland. And um, I hope I have pronounced that right, Sheila Ann. She'll, she'll set me straight if I haven't. Um, this is the charity that she'll be talking to you about today um, when she shares her experience uh, with you. And um, so we're delighted to have her uh, here today. And with that, I'm going to hand back uh, to Heidi. Thank you very much. Thanks, Helen. Um, now, Thomas Mulholland will, uh, will speak to us now about reporting on compliance in 2021. Okay, um, thanks Heidi. Um, I'm just going to share my screen with you here. Um, okay, hopefully everybody can see that. So, um, my name is Tom Holland. I'm Director of Compliance and Enforcement with the Charities Regulator. And welcome to Charities Trustees Week 2020. Um, the Compliance and Enforcement Unit, we've been um, part of our remit, has been um, um, rolling out the um, Governance Code, and our unit has been heavily involved in that. And obviously, as part of the, having um, gotten the start or rolled out the compliant the governance code we're also now uh, we'll be looking at the uh, compliance with it so we'll be interested in finding out you know how charities are finding um complying with the governance code and um how uh, what the compliance rates are with those uh, the, the the code so the first question so the question i'm going to be answering today is how are charities going to report to the charities regulator under compl compliance with the charities governance code? So I think that's a question that's of real interest to all you, all the trustees. And so first of all, I would like to find out uh, what if our charity, uh, our trustees aware of what is the charities governance code. So hopefully at this stage, uh, the majority of uh, trustees or indeed all trustees are aware of the existence of the charities governance code. Um, hopefully as well you've looked at it and, and started work on uh, completing compliance with the governance code and on our website we have a whole section dedicated to the charities governance code it's under our information for charities tab and there's a lot of information available there there's a lot of guidance documents there's a lot there's a frequently asked questions section there's also um, a sample uh, compliance record form. So it's even got examples of how um, a, a compliance record form can, can, can be completed. And I know that document especially has been of use to a lot of charity trustees in um, assisting them in fill, filling out their own uh, compliance record forms. So like I say, there's a lot of information available. Training has also been provided online. So a lot of information out there for charity trustees. And like I say, I hope, um, most charity trustees are now aware of the governance code and what's involved in it. So, as you're probably aware, the, the charity governance code is split into six principles. I'm not going to go start going through the principles here. We've already provided um, courses in relation to the, the charity's governance code. I just want to bring in your attention at, of what it is and how it, it can assist the charities. And that's, that is the purpose of the charity's governance code. It's to assist charities to be the best charity you can be, to assist you in the governance, to run your charity in, in, in the best manner possible. So it's really a tool to assist charities and to help them on the journey to be um, the best char the charity you can possibly be. So this here is um, a, a blank compliance record form. So this is the document that uh, you would be filling up to uh, record how you are complying with the charity's governance code. So that's just one page out of it. And like I say, that's, that page is, or that document is available on the charities regulator website. And again, there's a, a completed sample on the Charity Regulator website of this compliance record form showing you how it can be completed and what evidence you would need to record to show that your charity is in compliance with the code. Now, once this form is completed, you, you as trustees, you as a charity, will retain the document in the charity. There's no necessity to send it into the Charity Regulator. You'll retain it in the charity. You can use it as a guide, as a reference point to go back and review it, the charity's governance code on, on a regular basis. It's your document to retain. The charity's regulator will only look for it if we happen to pick your charity for a compliance checks. And if that is the case, we will specifically request you to, um, to send us in your copy of your compliance record form. So 
there's no need to send any documentation into the charge into the charges regulator. It's all retained in the in the uh, in your charity. So up on up to date uh, of what's been happening up to date is that this page here may be familiar to you if you've been involved in the completion of the annual report to the charities regulator in relation to your charity. So every charity must make must submit an annual report to the charities regulator, and there's various questions and information has to be provided on that report. And in this year, in 2020. One of the questions has been, please indicate if your organization has commenced the implementation of the Charities Governance Code. And there was an answer yes or no to that. So already in 2020, uh, we in the Charities Regulator have been um, um, monitoring responses to this question and we've um, been able to engage with charities then who have commenced the implementation of the Charities Governance Code. We've got feedback from them and that feedback has been hugely helpful. Um, it's uh, helped us to tailor the guidance documents that we produce during the year. It's also been um, very useful for the frequently asked questions section on the, on the website. It's fed directly into that. So we, like I say, we've got feedback from a lot of charities during over the course of the year in relation to the Charities Governance Code. And I have to say, the, 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 most of the feedback has been positive in, in relation to the Charities Governance Code. Charities have said that if they found it a useful document, once it got into it, got stuck into it and got through it, it has been a useful document. So the question then is, what will appear on annual reports in January 2021? So on the previous slide, I showed you the question that's currently on your annual report. In 2021, when your charity goes to file its, file its annual report, there will be a, a, a declaration. So you'll be making a declaration on your annual report in 2021. So if your charity is fully compliant with the Charities Governance Code, at the date you're making the, the declaration. So in other words, on the day you are filing the annual report, on that day is your charity, if it, is it fully compliant with the Charities Government Code, then you can declare that on your annual report. I'm calling that the Declaration A, okay? So that's where the charity has gone through the full process of um, going through the, 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 the Charities Governance Code. It's carried out all the work, it's recorded all the evidence to show that it's in compliance with it. So it's fully up to speed with the Charities Governance Code. And that declaration then is made on the annual report whenever it's filed in 2021. Second is then if a charity is partially compliant with the Charities Governance Code. So this is where a charity is um, has has completed most of the Charities Governance Code, but it may not be in, in, in compliance with a certain section of it due to some issue. And it will be possible for make it, for that charity to make a declaration that says that it's partially compliant with the Charities Governance Code. And there'll be a free text box and that box will be um, available there for the charity to explain why it's not in full compliance. So again, uh, we would be interested in seeing you know, what impediments is there to charities um, being fully in compliance with the Charities Governance Code. So hopefully we'll get a lot of information back in relation to those um, free text box. So I'm calling that Declaration B. And then Declaration C is where if a charity has not started implementing the Charities Governance Code, it will make that declaration. And again, there'll be a free text box allowing the charity to explain why it's not in compliance. And again, we'll be, we'll be monitoring those, um, those explanations to find out, is there a reason? Is there anything for any further guidance or assistance we can give to charities to bring them into compliance with the code? So this is just an example of what the, um, the partial, a declaration of partial compliance will look like. This is just a mocked up sample that I produced for this, this talk. So you can see here, this charity is making its annual report and in it, it's saying that it's in compliance with 6.6 .6 and 6.7 of the, of the Charities Governance Code, but it's not in compliance with section 6.8. And there will be a free text box for that charity to explain why it's not in compliance with that section. So that's what it will look like. A tick box exercise and then an, a, a free text box to explain why any organization is not in compliance with a particular section of the governance code. Okay, so once your, your, your charity files its annual report in 2021, uh, what will appear on the register? So there's three options. So the first one is where if, you, if any charity which declares it is in compliance with the codes, that's the declaration A I mentioned earlier, will have that declaration publicly displayed on the register from the day that the annual return is filed. So if your charity, has all the um, work done in relation to the Charities Governance Code, you're fully in compliance and you're declaring that to the, to the, on your annual report to the Charities Regulator. That will be publicly available on the Charities Register 
from the date that you file the return. Okay. The second option is if uh, the charity, the compliance status of any charity that declares it is in partial compliance with the code, so declaration B that we we're looking at in the previous slide, will not be publicly visible on the register. So if a charity makes a declaration, it's only in partial compliance, that will not be visible on the register. Nothing will appear on the register unless that charity specifically requests that declaration is shown along with the reason for partial compliance. So again, that's to allow any charity that's made full, that had made progress towards being fully compliant with the code, but which just hasn't got to the, got it completed. So there's some reason why it's close to being resolved, but just hasn't got to the, the charity's code and its code completed. It'll be able to declare that and also the reason why it's not, not um, completed. Now that's only if the, that charity um, um, wants that declaration to appear. And the third option is where the compliance status of any charity that declares it has not started implementing the code and is not in compliance, that's declaration C, that will not be visible on the register in 2021. Okay, so this here is, a, again, it's a mocked up sample here of what the register might look like where uh, a charity has declared partial compliance with the code. So if you look up uh, any charity, can anybody can look up the, the, charge, the <clears throat> register of charities on the Charities Regulator website. And this is the information that appears, the name of the charity, uh, the charity number. And there's various tabs here. These, these are all standard tabs. And from 2021, one of the tabs will have the declaration of uh, the, that the charity is in compliance with the Charities Governance Code. So here's an example of a charity that is in partial compliance with the code and it's also opted for it to be visible on the register and it's saying that uh, here are the sections that it's not in compliance with and the reasons why it's not in compliance. That's just a mocked up sample of what it will look like. Again, as Helen mentioned earlier on, an information note was released there in October setting out all this information. So that again, that information note is available on the website, the Charities Regulator website. So in 2021, um, so next year, it will be possible for charities to update their status on the register in relation to the compliance with the code. So if you are a charity in, uh, in, in March 2021, you uh, submit your annual report. At that time, you're only partially in compliance with the governance code and you make that declaration. Subsequently, in say June of 2021, whatever issue um, that was that, that that had led you not being in compliance with the governance code, that's been sorted out and now you're fully in compliance with the code, you will be able to go back in to your uh, account on the Charities Regulator website and you'll be able to update your declaration. So on the, on the, on the um, Charities Regulator website, we're looking for the most up-to-date position in relation to um, the, the compliance with the governance code of all charities because all the information on register should be as up-to-date as possible. It's the same with your trustees. We want the most up-to-date listing of trustees on, your, on, the chart, on the register, and we also want the most up-to-date declaration in relation to your compliance with the governance code. So the charges regulator, we will be monitoring compliance rates with the governance code and the reasons for non-compliance. And the reason for that is we want to understand why charities are not in compliance. We want to assist them to come into compliance with the code. It's, um, it's, it's, it's the aim of the charities regulator to improve um, confidence in the, in the charity sector as a whole. And we are looking for the governance code will assist us in achieving that aim. And so that's why we want all charities to be in compliance. We're looking to assist them as much as possible, provide further guidance. If there's any issues with the recurring issues with the, with the governance code, we can maybe address these with um, a frequently asked question and assist charities as much as possible to come into compliance with the, with the charities governance code. We've already been in contact, like I mentioned earlier, with charities who have completed the code. The feedback in relation to the code has been quite positive, I have to say. Um, most charities have said that once they got stuck into it, once really got going at the charities governance code, filling it out, they found it actually quite a useful exercise. Um, it, 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 it would trigger, uh, it triggered a lot of um, of, of talk of, of communication between trustees and you know the, the direction of the charity and the governance of the charity which is exactly what we were hoping for we want charities to have, trustees to have these conversations and like i say the reason for all this is to is to drive confidence in the charity sector and we're the, you know the governance code will increase public trust and confidence in charities and um, it's it's going to be used uh, uh, um, certainly charities 
are going to um, put it on their uh, website. They're welcome to put it on their website to say that they are in compliance with the Charities Governance Code. And donors will also be able to check our register, check, check the register of charities to see if a charity has declared that it is compliance with the code. So that's uh, hopefully I've answered all the questions you had in relation to how you come at, you declare compliance with the, code, with the governance code in 2021 and also how that's going to be shown on the register during 2021. So the key, one of the key questions that keep comes up is when do we have to have the code completed by? The code was launched in November 2018. It was um, at the time it was launched. The, it was it was um, it was set out that we that charities should be in compliance by December 2020, and we would hope that it, that is still the case. We would hope that all charities would be in compliance by January 2020, or sorry, by December 2020. And uh, we would hope that all charities be in compliance with the government's code as soon as possible. And then in 2021, you will be reporting on your compliance with the governance code at the date that you're filing your annual report. So if your annual report date is the 31st of January 2021, at that date, you will be declaring that you are in compliance with the Charities Governance Code. If, you're, if your annual report date is the 31st of October 2021, at that date, you will be able to, uh, to submit your declaration to say that you're in compliance with the Governance Code on the 31st of October 2021. And as always, it's possible for charities to file their annual report um, any time in 2021. So like I say, that's all I um, have to say about the um, reporting and compliance with the, with the governance code. The last slide I'm going to throw in here, this is, um, I always, whenever I get the opportunity to talk to um, directly to charity trustees, and it's always great to have the opportunity to, to talk directly to trustees. This is, a, this is my favourite um, guidance document from the Charities Regulator. If it's possible to have a favourite document, this is mine. It's called Internal Financial Control Guidelines for Charities. And I always mention this document because I think it's a really useful document for trustees to, um, in relation to the financial controls that should be uh, in place on their charity. And again, obviously, that would feed into the, uh, as part of the, the, the Charities Governance Code. So I'm just mentioning that document uh, as, a, a, as an aside. And um, that brings me to the end of my talk. So I'll hand you back to Heidi there. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. Um, and just to let everyone know, we will be circulating Tom's slides after the webinar today, along with a survey to see how you get on. And we'll include in that Tom's favourite guidance document about internal financial controls there as well. So now um, I will introduce Sheila Ann O'Leary. Sheila Ann is a trustee and um, I might, I'll just get her, her video up there, sorry. Sheila Ann, are you able to get your video started? Ah, there you are to unmute. Hi, so, Sheila Ann, we have Hi, Heidi. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much, Sheila Ann, for agreeing to come on and talk to everyone today because it's all very well us talking, like Helen was saying, it's all very us, well, the, the regulators saying how we see things being done or how they should be done. But it's much more useful, I think, for charity trustees, particularly the week that's in it, to hear from a charity trustee like yourself, somebody who's been through the road to compliance with the Charities Governance Code. So we really appreciate you coming on today. Um, so Sheila, and I might just ask you to introduce yourself to um, our attendees today, if you wouldn't mind. Great, thanks Heidi and thanks to everybody else. Um, as Helen says, my name is Sheila Ann. I'm living in West Cork. I'm a trustee and board member of West Cork Women Against Violence Project, uh, which is self-explanatory, I think, and Aurelia Trust, which is a charity that works with um, group homes essentially in uh, Romania, uh, the children that had been uh, rescued, we should say, from the orphanages all those years ago. We still call them our children, but they're, they're uh, quite adult, I can tell you. And um, I'm also highly, very involved in a couple of community organisations and also FAILACON, which is the Stillbirth and Neonatal Association um, of Ireland. And my sister, along with a group of um, six other parents, formed that organisation back in 2006 and 2008. It was incorporated in 2010. 
And when we talk about the journey of compliance and governance and so on, actually, Felicon started the journey back in 2006, and perhaps the board members didn't even realise they were on the um, governance journey because if you look at the first principle, advancing the charitable purpose, and this is something I think that every board member and every staff member and every active volunteer in any organization needs to remember is the purpose. Why did you form the organization in the first place? And you need to keep that central to it. And actually, if you do that, you'll find that the other five principles then will actually support and they'll fall into um, to place. So. Um, when we look at, at the, the Felicon's journey, I think that would be, from a personal point of view, that's when the board started. And then from a, a I suppose, a, a formal compliance um, in 2018, I completed the Certificate of Charity Law, Trusteeship and Governance with the Law Society and the WHEEL. It was a fantastic course. And I took my learning back to the board. And we started the process then. We knew it was coming down the tracks. We knew we had to do it. And it started off as a kind of, we have to do it. Oh, we better get on with it and do it. Actually, it was a fantastic experience. It was empowering for all people involved in it because essentially we knew, God, you know, we're good. We're actually, we, we've a huge amount of it done. And I think that was really important. And so Sheila, and then, so you were saying you knew it was coming down the tracks, of mm. course, uh, since its launch date. Yeah. But do you want to just talk us through maybe the approach, the, the, the practical approach that, that you took to mm -hmm. starting? I suppose I, I was slightly ahead of, of the, the, the game, if you want to say that, because of the, um, the, the having completed the certificate. But when it actually came to it, we, don't, we spent some time on the charity's website. We downloaded all the documents. We spent a bit of time actually making the plan. And I think that's really, really important that it be, otherwise it becomes very very daunting and we dipped in and out of it over a period of time there was numerous drafts and that is something that we all need to be aware of it is an ongoing uh, working document and just because even going back to what Tom was saying we do want to be able to tick the boxes next year and say yep we're fully compliant but you don't want to throw the, all of this into the drawer then or up in a, in a shelf and say, that's it done. It needs to be reviewed and it needs to, to be revised uh, all the time. So that's where we started. We looked at the Word document itself and we broke it down into the sections because you'll find, and I'm sure it's the same with all board members, is that every board member has a different, um, I suppose, um, commitment to the different uh, processes they have different skill sets and some are more comfortable with other with, with some parts than other parts of it so that's what the board did we broke it down into the different sections and said okay who's going to tackle that so different trustees took a different principle if you like to focus on that right? absolutely yeah and and we we grouped them together for example uh, the charitable purpose obviously the 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 parents themselves it, it's crucial that the 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 work it, the purpose of the organization is to support anybody who has uh, been affected by the death of a baby around birth and that was really important because um, whilst you might think it's going to be the, the, we'll say the parents and the siblings and the immediate family, it's also about the, the staff, it's also about policy makers and so on. And so it was to keep that in place. And when you look at the actual document itself, and I just have it open in another computer here, for example, be clear about the purpose of your charity and be able to explain this in simple terms. Everybody should be able to do that. It's almost like your, your, your sales pitch. When anybody asks you, um, are you involved, what organization are you involved in? What does your charity say? You should be able to roll it off your tongue from the heart. And then the question is asked, well, what do you actually do? What actions do you take? And how do you prove it? So when you look at it, you look at the document first and it might appear to be daunting. But as you break it down, as you look at the, the questions that are being asked, it's a bit like the, the, the teacher or the college lecturer saying, read the question. And when you read it, you actually say, yeah, you know what? That's OK, we have that. And yes, it's on our website or yes, it's in every policy document that we have. And it's actually is, is there's a lot of the work done you'll find before you even start. So did you find it? useful in that way then Sheila Anne, as, a, as an exercise to undergo then as an organization absolutely fantastic exercise once we started on it and we discovered there was maybe little gaps or things that could be improved 
we were able to do that. So it has been very useful and, and it's strengthened the organization. That's fantastic to hear. Mm. And you mentioned there, of course, it's a, it's a live document. It's a working document and one that, that needs to be reviewed by all charities um, as they go on uh, with their work. So is there anything that in, in future years that you might do differently? Is there anything that you would change? I think one of the things is, is um, you know, I think it deserves, it, first of all, it requires a lot of time. And it most certainly deserves it because it is, if you like, it's the statement of everything that the organization of the, char that the, the charity stands for. And so in reflection, I think I would say put more time into it, put time aside, set goals, create timelines and give it the attention that it deserves. Very good. And then so lastly, then, Sheila, do you have any advice for, because some people, you're, you, you've gone through the process now yourself, you've completed your form. Yeah. A lot of charities, even from our poll today, we can see a lot of people, they've read the code, they've maybe started their compliance form. Some people haven't started their compliance form yet. And a lot of people are very new into the sector and maybe haven't begun the process. So do you have any advice to somebody who's been through the process? I think the first part of the advice would be get started. You know, the journey of the thousand miles and all that is actually just started. Make the first step. It's like typing in the first piece of information on it. First reading, it is a bit daunting. You might be asking yourself how to, to answer those questions. Tom mentioned already about the compliance record, the sample that's there on the website. When you download it and look at it, you can see, oh yeah, that actually makes a lot of sense. You'll see how it flows and then you'll actually be able to, to pull in the information together. As I mentioned, put the time into it. It does require it. It does deserve it. You're going to place a value on the process and on the outcomes and you become a much stronger organisation as a result of it, most certainly. Very good. Thank you so much for talking to us today, Sheila. It's been really, really useful and I, I'm sure our attendees will find the benefit of, of hearing yeah. from your experience. So thank you so much Great. for coming out. Thanks, Heidi, and thanks for giving us the opportunity. Thanks, Sheila. Thanks. So now, everyone, we will have a Q&A session with um, some senior members from the Charities Regulator. So if I could just ask um, some of my colleagues to maybe put their cameras on. Um, and so you've all met um, Helen Martin, of course, our CEO already, and Thomas Mulholland, our Head of Compliance and Enforcement. And I'll just um, introduce two more faces you're seeing there. Eamon O'Halloran is Head of Registration and Projects at the Charities Regulator. And Yelena Krishenko is Head of Compliance Monitoring. So they'll be joining us for the, for the question and answer session. And as I said, we'll get through as many as we can. And if your question is not answered today, it might pop up on the, the FAQ section that we're going to add to the events page on our website, or you can use the contact us tab on our website and submit your question and, we, and a member of staff will be happy to get back to you. So um, I just, I'll crack on. So, um, and the first question that we got in was, um, well, we got a couple of questions in just asking for a reiteration, I think, of the dates. So, Thomas, you might just go through, explain again, when do people need to be able to report on their compliance? Yeah, like I said, the, um, the, the, the compliance, the governance, the, the code was launched in November 2018, so it was launched quite a, a, a while back. And um, at the time, it was, it was envisaged that every charity would be in compliance by December 2020. So... We'd hope that everybody be in compliance by December 2020, but you know it's the case that a charity is not going to be in compliance. You know that they could be able to work on it, and the actual date of declaration. So when you'll be reporting to the charities regulator on it would be the date that you're filing your annual report. Okay, so if your annual report is due on the 31st of March 2021, that's the date you'll be you'll be you'll be you'll be making your declaration of compliance, and it's at that date that we're interested in knowing if you're in compliance or not. So it's the date that you're filing your annual report, whether you're in compliance with the governance code is the, is the key date. Okay, thanks, Thomas. So the next one that we got in is this um, charity trustee says, asks, if some standards don't apply to my charity, i.e. employment law, can we still declare full compliance? Um, yes, so I'll take that question. Um, um, some charities will find that certain standards are not applicable and that's okay, you just simply 
stated on the form that they're not applicable and just state the reason why. Uh, but if you meet all of other applicable standards, then your charity is in full compliance with the code. Okay, super. And so another, uh, a, a similar question um, or related, how do I know if my charity needs to fill out the additional standards? Um, and then actually, and I'll give another question then, which is linked to that, which is how do you classify what a smaller charity is? Okay, so if you look at the code, you will see that there are six principles and then under each principle you will find a number of core standards that every charity in Ireland is expected to achieve and there are also additional standards for more complex charities. So the, the code was specifically written without defining what charities should achieve those additional standards because ultimately it's the decision for charity trustees to make and because of the diversity of the sector, it was actually hard to define complex charities. So as trustees, uh, there are certain things you should look at, like um, level of income, for example. Um, you should look if your charity is working with vulnerable people. And if you are, that will make you a more complex charity for the purpose of the code, or maybe if you're operating overseas. So these are the things that you should be looking at, you know, when deciding if your charity should achieve. Um, additional standards. Okay, thanks, Elena. So this question came in advance, <coughs> excuse me, came into us in advance of the webinar. Um, this trustee asks, we've um, if we declare that we're fully compliant in good faith, and then the charities regulator does an audit or asks for our documentation, and they find that in some way we're not fully compliant, what will happen? Uh, maybe I'll take that one high. Yeah, as I said during my, my talk, the, the, the aim of the charity regulator is, is to have all charities in compliance with the code. And we are here to assist and to advise charities to achieve that aim. So if, if it happens, if, if a charity has made a, you know, a genuine effort to, to be in compliance with the code, and then when we review it, there's areas that can be improved in it, or you know, you know, there's been a misunderstanding, we'll simply you know advise the charity of that, assist them to be in compliance, and, and, and like I say, that is the aim of the charity regulator to have everyone in compliance with the code and for us to assist them and help as much as possible on the journey. I just might come in there as well, Adi, just to say, you know, to reiterate what, what Thomas is saying there. Look, next year is the first year that you're going to be asked as charities to report on your compliance. And, you know, we are aware that it is going to be new for charity trustees. So, you know, we, we've said publicly on a number of occasions that we are going to be very conscious of this fact, the fact that it's new, and the fact that it is going to take some time for people to become familiar with the level um, and quality uh, of um, evidence that you, you need to be retaining to, to show you your compliance if it's required um, from the regulator. Um, and as Thomas said, it's really about working with, with charities. So in those particular cases, we look at exactly what happened. You know, why was it that a charity thought it was in compliance when in fact it wasn't? Um, and we'd be working closely with them. And that, you know, that's the approach we're going to take, as I said, next year for 2021, because it's the first year. Um, and then, you know, over the years, we'll be revising and developing our compliance and monitoring function. But it will be um, acknowledging that this is going to take a bit of time uh, for the sector uh, to embed this um, in, in, their, in their different organisations. Okay, thanks, Helen. So the next question that's come in is, do small charities have to have unabridged accounts, given that it is in the additional standards section? I think so. Yes, so, so what I'll say here, and um, just uh, just in general terms, charities should be as open and as as transparent as they can in relation to their finances, in relation to their governance structures. Um, and they and there should be no reason why a charity is filing a breached account. Because um, and for those who are not familiar with the term a breached account, it's basically a set of accounts that does not have any information in relation to income and expenditure of that charity, and then the level of disclosures is quite limited. So those type of accounts do not really tell much um, about your charity finances and, and governance. So uh, so what I'll say here all charities should be as open as they can in relation to their finances and governance. 
I think, sorry, if I could just come in there as well um, on, on that one. I mean, what we're, what we are, we're seeing is that we, we see a, a bridged accounts in circumstances where in order to actually create those, you have to have a full set of accounts anyway. Um, and what we would say to charities who are companies in particular is that while it may be legally permissible under uh, company law for you to file those abridged accounts, we do think that as charities, you owe a level of disclosure and transparency because of the nature of the public support and funding that you get to be fully transparent. So it's, it's really about doing, uh, doing the right thing. And to be fair, we have found some charity trustees who've come to us to say, we had no idea that these were filed um, uh, by way of abridged accounts. So it's a, it's a good question for charity trustees to go back and make sure whoever is filing their accounts for them, that they're, they're filing full accounts and, and being transparent and at least understand what you're doing as a, as a charity. Thanks, Anna. Um, we have one here now about um, annual reports, so maybe Eamon, this might be one for you. Um, our charity found it difficult coping with COVID-19 and we've missed our deadline to file our annual report. Yes, so if they were due to file between the 12th of March 2020 and the uh, up until actually the 15th of December, that's been extended to the 16th of December, so you still have time. And if you haven't filed uh, for longer than that period, we would uh, ask you to do your best to, to submit that annual report to get into compliance as soon as possible. I would also encourage anyone who's in that situation uh, that they should write into us and, and let us know what's happening uh, and, and we can look at the circumstances, but, but that would be the advice to them. Thanks, Eamon. So the next question, um, this trustee asks, once we've completed the compliance record form, do we need to add anything to our entry on the Register of Charities or to our own website? So I guess what they're asking is, should they, should they be publicising the fact that they've completed their form and they're in compliance with the code? Yeah, well, if I, I'll take that one. Well, one of the questions, like I said in, in my talk, was that one of the questions on the annual report will be a declaration that will be required by each charity to say that it's whether or not it's in compliance with the governance code. And certainly, apart from that declaration, um, I would encourage charities to to, to, to publicise the fact they are on, in, in compliance with the code on their own website. They're certainly welcome to do that. And I think it's an opportunity perhaps for charities to encourage um, donations and to de demonstrate to the public that they did that, that governance is, is a serious issue and that they take it seriously and they've been they've made the effort to be in compliance with the code so it's certainly an option for charities to to to, to put that on their own website and th this is this is kind of related as well actually we had another trustee uh, they're talking about funding in particular they're saying is there going is it going to be is it going to be mentioned on the charities regulator website if we're in compliance we're wondering for funders so I think they're wondering, is it going to be advertised on our on the, the register of charities and um, which charities are in compliance or not? Yeah, but it will be uh, anybody, uh, the, the declaration, if a charity is in full compliance with the governance code in 2021, that declaration will be uh, publicly available on the register, the same as any other the standard information about charities, such as the listing of trustees, some financial information, the, you know, the contact details for the charity, anybody can any, any member of the public or any donor or any funder can go into our website and look up each an individual charity and, and get basic information and one of the items of information that will be available in 2021 will be the declaration of compliance with the governance code if the charity makes that declaration thanks thomas so the next question in from a trustee and this is a difficult one and um, we haven't been able to meet because of COVID 19 what can we do? Because some of our trustees don't have stable internet access. We haven't been able to sign off on some of the principles yet. So how can they meet, I guess, if they don't have stable internet access this year? I suppose I can come in here, um, as well as using internet, uh, trustees can use phones and uh, somebody can set up a, maybe a, a conference call for trustees. And also, um, maybe some people are not aware, uh, platforms like Zoom allow people to actually dial in by phone. So if you're not comfortable using uh, maybe um, internet or, you know, those kind of online platforms, you can always use your phone. And I suppose that's something you can look into. Thanks, Elena. 
Um, sorry, no. I might just come in there as well. I think one of our one of our partners um, for this week, for Charity Trustees Week and um, Board Match, uh, had some useful guidance on that on that specific issue of what you do if you can't physically uh, meet. So that's um, some material there that I would I would advise uh, that that person to look at as well. Right. Thanks, Elena and Hella. So the next question we have in just now uh, from a trustee is: If a charity gets no public funding. What is the requirement on it to be compliant with the Charities Governance Code? I'll answer that one. The, the Governance Code has, has nothing to do with funding. Funding is entirely a matter for individual charities and all charities, as, as that uh, question points out, um, are funded in different ways. Some people may be entirely funded by the state or partially or may in fact get no funding at all. The Charities Governance Code is about charities being regulated and it is a set of standards of basic governance requirements that all charities um, who are registered are required to comply with. So the issue is not your source of funding, the issue is the fact that you are a charity operating in Ireland and you are a registered charity. So it applies equally across the board. Thanks Helen. So the next question is, um, is there a simplified code for very small charities? Well, the code is, is, is in itself directed at small charities. So it was written um, and we got assistance uh, from NALA actually to make sure that it was, it was plain English. So uh, the code itself is, is directed, as, as I said, very much towards the smaller purely volunteer led charities. Um, and it's one of the reasons why um, I think it was quite well received originally in any event because it was something that people felt that they could work with because it was easy to follow. Um, and also I think the fact that it's split out into the core standards which apply to all charities, um, and then the additional standards um, should, should make it easier. In addition to that, we have a full suite of, of guidance materials that are available um, online, and these include things like templates, how do you do your minutes, um, you know, all of which is designed with smaller charities in mind. Thanks, Helen. So the next one, I think, Yelena, probably is, is um, a question for you, really. Um, do charities have to prepare SORP accounts? This trustee is asking. Um, at the you moment, might tell people what SORP accounts are just in the first instance. Yeah, so, so basically, Charity SORP um, sets out uh, how to prepare um, uh, charity accounts uh, in line with FRS 102, and it sets out certain standards that charities should, uh, should follow. Um, so charity SORP is not a legal requirement for charities at the moment, so it's optional. Um, so, uh, so to answer that question, um, you don't have to prepare charity SORP accounts, but you can um, if, 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 you, if you want, and we, and we would encourage charities to look into that uh, uh, for uh, trans just, just in terms of from transparency and accountability point of view, uh, because charity SORP accounts are a lot more detailed than a normal set of accounts. Um, and they'll provide, they actually provide um, a lot of information about charities, um, achievements, um, finances, governance, uh, and things like that. Thanks, Elena. So the next one then is about, um, it's from a school. We are a school. Uh, do we need to comply the same way as other charities do with the Charities Governance Code? That's it. Yeah, Yelena might, might come in there, but it, schools have actually a, a, a governance code that specifically applies um, and it's rolled out by the Department of Education. And that particular code uh, was something that the Department of Education would have engaged with us on, on the basis that we had uh, the Charities Governance Code. So um, the focus for, for schools who are charities should be um, the code that they have um, that came out to them from the Department of Education. And if you're meeting those standards, um, you will be meeting the, the standards that are set out in the Charities Governance Code. Okay, thanks, Helen. So the next question is, in the additional standards, what is meant by partnerships? Yeah, so, so I can take that. I suppose partnership um, comes, up, comes up quite sometimes because um, a lot of people seem to com confuse, um, you know, the term partnership with them, um, with the requirement to consider mergers kind of, kind of formal arrangements. Um, but it's not just about formal ar arrangements like mergers. Um, it can also include other things like, you know, um, work and 
maybe networking, um, uh, maybe um, doing a joint events with charities or maybe doing a joint advertising and things like that. It's just basically trying to kind of reach out to other charities for maybe some help, some, some guidance. Um, uh, so as I said, it's not just about for formal arrangements like mergers, but it's also about just working with other charities just in general. Thanks, Elena. So the next question, I think we've, we've time for one or two last questions. Next question is about insurance. Um, trustee asks, is there now an increased need for trustee indemnity insurance? Would you recommend that all trustees have this type of insurance? Um, just in relation to insurance, um, I suppose, I suppose what, what I'll say is just in kind of general terms, um, uh, charity trustees have legal duty to protect charitable assets. Um, and insurance can be used as a way to protect your assets. It shouldn't be the only way, but it can be used um, as a way uh, to protect your assets. And just to give you an example, um, in terms of you know, the type of insurance that you might need, um, for example, um, you might need um, insurance to cover a property against loss or damage. So you would have things like um, building insurance or um, contents insurance. Or if you're planning an event, for example, you may need an insurance for that event. Um, who, uh, but, but what I'll say, if you're thinking about taking out any type of insurance, you should consider taking professional advice in relation to that um, if, if you don't have the expertise on, on, on the board yourselves. Um, maybe, maybe speaking to, to an insurance broker, um, they, they should be able to provide you with with some advice in relation to that. Okay, thanks. I might just come in there briefly, yeah. Heidi, as well, that there is there is professional indemnity insurance. I think that's maybe what that question was was getting at, um, and that is that is available out there from from uh, I think a number of providers. Eamon might might correct me on that, but I think uh, it is available to charity trustees, and it's certainly something that uh, that charity trustees should consider. Um, I would say particularly you you, uh, you know certainly we would often see it obviously in the case of of companies where um, the directors who are who are charity trustees will will often have professional indemnity insurance um, but it, it, I would say it's particularly important as well if you're an association so um, if, if, you, if you're not set up as a company and you don't have that protection of limited liability that it is something you should, you should definitely consider as, as charity trustees but again as, as Elena was, was saying there it's, it's something that you should really get some advice on um, but certainly from what we see and um, that's where I would see the, the need being that it's something that you consider and it is something that is available to be bought out there um, in the market for, from insurance Thanks. Could I come in just for one second, Heidi, just to say, Gina. I think, yeah, um, I think what we need to remember as as trustees is that you are the guardian. Um, you you have an obligation, not only a legal but a moral obligation, and sticking to the six principles is the most uh, important thing of all. And you know, we were talking about. The partnership question um, if you're going to go in collaborating with anybody you need to make sure that they're as tuned in and as as committed as you are yourself that's a really uh, good point yeah. Sheila. yeah thank you and also that the chair it, it chimes as well with your charitable purpose that you know Absolutely. that you're not you don't end up through a partnership with another charity getting involved in something that doesn't advance your charitable purpose so yeah they have to be you know very carefully aligned when we talk about entering into yeah. any kind of arrangement yeah Okay, I think we're just, it's just one o'clock. I'll ask one very, la very final question because um, it's, a, it's a simple enough one. Um, this trustee says that there's a lot of mention of minutes in the compliance record form. Um, is it consider, does the regulator consider it best practice to add the governance code to, an, to be an agenda item for discussion at every board meeting or even at the AGM? Yeah, and that's something that we would always suggest, you know, that charities do, like, you know, because you have to remember that governance code, it's your compliance record form, it's it's your live document, it's an ongoing process. So that's something you should be looking at all the time. So having it on the agenda at your meetings, it's, it's, it's a good place to start, um, at least. Okay, thanks, Elena. So as I said, we're just at one o'clock, we're a minute past. Um, I'd like to thank Sheila Ann again for coming on to join uh, the staff at the Charities Regulator for today's webinar. Um, we'd like to wish you all um, a lovely Charity Trustees Week um, 
I hope you found all your webinars and events really useful. And of course, if you have any further questions, please do get in touch via the Contact Us tab on our website. Our website is www.charitiesregulator.ie, just here behind me, in fact. Um, and a member of staff will be happy to get back to you. So thank you very much and enjoy the rest of your day.